Jesus is our living hope has been our summer series so far. And it's a study of the little book of the Bible called 1 Peter. You know, Peter was one of the disciples of Christ. And after his resurrection, Peter says, he is our living hope. We have a hope as Christians, not in death, but in life. And he is our living hope. He started the little letter out by saying, he is our living hope when we don't fit in. He calls us aliens and strangers and that we just don't fit into this world. The world we're like a square peg trying to fit into a round mold. We don't fit into the world because we're different. He's chosen us. He's elected us. He's foreknown us, the very first verses say. After he moves from those first few verses in the book, he says, Christ is your living hope when you're tested by fiery trials. Now, all of our students know what a test is, and they know the ones that were tough, and they know the ones that they're facing will be tough. Well, there's tough tests in life, too. Not everything goes your way in life, and Christ is our living hope when you're tested by fire. He goes on to say, hey, Christ is your living hope when the world is trying to press you into its mold. And we talked about having a jello mold, and the world has its mold, and they want you to be poured into it. But God has made you in his image, and he has a purpose for you. Don't let the world push you into its mold. So he says, you need Christ as a living hope so that you are not pressured by the world to be what the world is, but you can be all that God wants you to be. Then he turns and he says, you need Christ as your living hope when you face conflicts. It's not if you're going to face conflicts, but when you face conflicts, because they are coming. He talked about internal conflicts between your new nature you receive when you become a Christian. When you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life and take over as Master and Lord, you're going to have a conflict with your own life, the old life. The old life's going to war against the new life, and the new life's going to war against the old life, and you've got this internal conflict, so you wind up doing things you don't want to do, and you're doing things that you, you don't do the things you want to do. And so you have this internal conflict, but Christ is your living hope to get past that. He said not only will it be internal, it will be external. You're going to have people on the outside that just don't like you, and you need Christ as your living hope. And he talks about other conflicts that you have as well. Today I want to talk about this one. Christ is your living hope when your boss is in your face. Now, my administrative assistant, Kelly, is here today. And so uh, I told her this message was for her. Uh, what do you do when your boss is in your face? Before I tell, do that, I want to tell you a true story. True story is about a man by the name of Onesimus. He is a slave. He lives long ago. He lives in the Roman Empire. And he has a master. His master is a man by the name of Philemon. And Philemon, we don't know if he was a good master or a bad master. We're not told anything like that in history. But we are told that Onesimus, as a slave, owns nothing. His master owns him and everything. He is not free. He owns nothing, but he wants to run away from his master for freedom. And so what did he do? He stole from his master. Now, I don't know if he stole Roman coins or if he stole treasures of monetary value that he could take down to the pawn shop and trade in and convert it over to money, but he has stolen from his master. Now, the two of them live in a place called Colossae. Colossi, I got it on that map there. It's a little dot. It's in modern-day Tur Turkey. And so he decides he's going to steal this stuff and he's going to flee and he makes his way all the way to Rome in Italy. By land, it's a 1,200-mile journey. <laughs> now, if you go by ship, it would be just a little less than that, probably about seven or 800 miles. But in any case, he's trying to get away from his master with the stolen goods as the means by which to get there. And he arrives in Rome, and he's now ditched his master. But what happens to him is he runs into this itinerant preacher. In fact, he's not itinerant anymore because now he's got a tether on his leg. You see, tethers back then weren't mechanical. And, you know, they weren't uh, radio frequency and all of that. The tether was a chain around your leg. You were shackled to a Roman soldier. <laughs> and so he was uh, free to go. He was called house arrest. 
He could go home, and, and that's where he was home, but he had a Roman soldier with him all the time. They came in shifts, reshackled, changed. And so he, but he's free to preach, and he's preaching. And somehow, lo and behold, Onesimus comes across the itinerant preacher, the Apostle Paul, who's preaching in shackles, okay, for his faith, and he's preaching, and Onesimus accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior and makes him his Lord. He's an outstanding disciple of the Apostle Paul and the follower of Jesus. And he's, he's just a budding, growing in his faith. And at some point, he confesses to Paul, <clears throat> oh, by the way, I'm a runaway slave. I ran away from my master Philemon back in Colossae. And Paul thinks, hmm, Colossae, I've been there. Oh, yeah, on my missionary journeys before I got here. Where was that? Did you say Philemon? Well, I actually think I led Philemon to the Lord also. Lo and behold, isn't it a small world? Philemon, I know him. He owes me his eternal life because if I hadn't shared the gospel with him, he would be a dead man like everybody else bound to hell. He said, I know him. And so it is a small world. And so what happens in the story is, I know Philemon. In fact, I started the church that actually meets in his house. You see, the original churches didn't meet in buildings like this. They met at somebody's home. He said, yeah, I know him. I know his wife. I know, I know his son. Man, it's all coming back to me. And he said, but you know what? You got to go back to your master. You stole from him. You got to make reparations, restitution for what you've done. Now, this is a scary proposition because in the Roman world, if you're a runaway slave, your master, you are his property and he can beat you for your running away. You're just property. You're just to him like an ox. If the ox goes away, he'll go get that whip and he'll beat him and bring him back into submission. He can beat you. It's even worse than that because you're a runaway he can actually brand you as being a runaway for everybody to see. So you can't go anywhere without them saying, ah, he's a runaway slave. It even gets worse than that. Under the Roman world, he could put you in permanent retirement. He could take your life because you were just property. Can you imagine what's going through Onesimus' head? The Apostle Paul wants me to go back to my master, with this hanging over your head? And so Paul intervenes. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write you a letter. And I want you to carry it back to your master. And a letter is a masterpiece of resolving conflict. I'm not here to preach through that letter. I'm here to just tell you a couple points in it. He writes to Philemon, and about halfway down in the letter, he says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Interesting thing, Onesimus is a Greek word for useful. And at one point in the letter, he said, before he was useless to you, but now he is useful. Before he was useless because he didn't know Christ, but now he's a brother in Christ, he's useful to you. He says, I appeal to you as, uh, for my son. He calls him my son because he led him to the Lord. So he's his father in the faith. And he says to my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. I was incarcerated and preaching. And he came to Christ. And he says, isn't this a small world? I'm sending him back to you. Then he says, a little later in the letter, he says, if he has done, if he has done you any wrong of course he has he stole his goods if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything yeah he does charge it to me wow wow this is the christian spirit right here this is this is the christian spirit unfortunately we don't see it all that much today but it is the christian spirit to love the lord your god with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself no matter who your neighbor may be that was what the Good Samaritan story was all about. The religious people were not taking care of the neighbor, but the Samaritan, who was not Jewish, he was taking care of the Jew. And he said, who is the neighbor here? Who's being neighborly? It's the, it was the enemy that was their friend. He said, 
if he has done anything wrong, the good Samaritan told the guy that he dropped him off when he was taking care of him, says, if, take care of him, and whatever charge it takes, when I come back by, I'll pay for it. Paul is saying the same thing. Listen, he's now my son in the faith, and if he owes you anything, charge me, I'll pay for it. You see, that is the gospel. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. All of us. The wages of sin is death. That was the verse we were memorizing, we're quoting. The wages of sin is death. I should die for my sins. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord because Jesus paid our debt. That's going to be the thrust of why we help those that we don't even know. We help them. We help them. So he sends him back to Philemon, and we don't know any more from the Bible the rest of the story. I have to go to secular history to find the rest of the story. And so this is not authoritative. This comes from tradition. Tradition says that Onesimus was forgiven by Philemon and released from his prisoner, or from his slavery. And from there, he migrated over to Ephesus. Now, Paul had left, after he had been in Ephesus, Timothy as the pastor of the church there. And after Timothy passed, then a man by the name of Onesimus became the pastor at the church in Ephesus. Isn't this an amazing story? Wow, this is an amazing story. Hey, this is what I want to say. Long introduction, I'm sorry. Long introduction to get to my message today. Not every slave had an advocate like the Apostle Paul. In fact, you probably have either read in history or you have seen the movie called Spartacus. Spartacus had lived a century before, or thereabouts, before Onesimus. And he was a, a, a Grecian, or actually from Thrace, which is like modern Bulgaria, and he had been constricted into the Roman army, but something happened. He found himself out of the army, and he found himself as a gladiator, and he was a slave gladiator fighting for his life. Him and a friend by the name of Criscus, they actually planned a revolt, got out of their, their slavery, and, and they led a rebellion against the Roman Empire, and he gathered thousands and thousands of slaves with him, and he fought the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire was much larger than he was, and they finally put down the slave rebellion. And when the last of them were, were caught and they were all killed, they never found the body of Spartacus. But the 6,000 remaining Rebel, rebellious slaves, they were all crucified on the Appian Way all the way up to the city of Rome so everyone passing by could see what happens to rebellious slaves. Whoa. Onesimus was risking his whole life to leave and everything hinged upon the Apostle Paul advocating for his release. Is that amazing? Great, amazing story. Listen, not everyone had an advocate like the Apostle Paul. In fact, Peter writes, while Nero is emperor of Rome, and you know Nero, he's the one that was lighting up Christians in the Colosseum and releasing the wild animals to them, and these people were dying for their faith. In the Roman Empire, there were actually millions of, of, of slaves. And some of those slaves were converting to Christianity at great peril. And so when the Apostle Paul writes about what you do when your master is in your face, oh, he's not talking about cushy Christianity in the 21st century here in America. He's saying when you become a Christian, you could lose your life. You could lose your life. Wow. So what do you do when your master's in your face? Or what do you do when your boss is in your face? Because you see, in America, we don't have slaves anymore, do we? <laughs> Although we do sell our time to the company. And some say we sell our soul to the company. When, when I'm, I'm an employee, I'm like the slave. The boss tells me what I got to do, and if I don't do it, psh, I'm lost. I lose my job. I'm fired. That's it. So by application, it's when your boss is in your face. I want to say by application, it's even when your teacher is in your face. 
There's a reason why when you go to school, you get a bachelor's degree and then you get a master's degree. <laughs> well, if I'm a master and I was a master, I got a master's degree. And I pursued two of them, and then I pursued a doctorate. And he said, but when I, I had my master's degree, I could then teach. And I taught in seminary. And when I taught in seminary, my students had to call me doctor. But I was the master, and they were my students. You know, you thought I was going to say slaves. You thought I was going to say slaves. We see we still have this metaphor going on today that it's the person who's in authority over you. And the word authority itself means they have the right to command you to do something. It could be the police. I get pulled over and the officer says, I want to see your driver's license. I hand it over. I want to see your registration. Why do I do that? He's an authority or she's an authority. The last time it happened, I looked at that police officer and said, my ma'am, you certainly got beautiful purple eyes. She had purple contacts in. <laughs> I'm sure that's what got me off. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that's what got me off. That and the grace of God. Thank you, Lord. We got one going into the Marines. Listen, it's when the drill instructor is in your face. Those of us who have never been in the Marines, we've seen the movies, and they get right in your face. What do you do when the authority is in your face? And here's the answer. Be submissive. He says, slaves, submit yourself to your masters in the book of 1 Peter. You submit yourself to your masters. You can put in there employees, submit yourself to your bosses. You could put students, submit yourself to your teachers. You got the idea by application here. You do it with all respect. You do it with respect. Not only to those who are good and considerate, it's easy to be a good student to a good teacher. Through all my years of schooling, I've got to admit, I had some bad teachers. Now, they probably considered me the bad student. But he says, here, you submit with all, all, it's easy. It's easy when the teacher's good, but also to those who are harsh. You know the ones, they'll have, there's a rumor that goes around, you don't want that guy for a class. He piles on the work. You know why he piles on the work? To make you successful. That's what he does. Hey, listen, he's saying, even those who are harsh, you are submissive, you do what they're telling you to do. Of course, from the previous message in this, when the government is telling you to do things that are contrary to God and God's word, you always obey God rather than man. And that principle holds here too. You always obey God over man. I was in college. Most of you know I'm an artist. I, love, I like art. I do art. I, I do art. I took an art class. And they decided that we first year art students needed to have nude models. Well, I knew the Bible told me that's not right. That's not right. So I had to skip those classes. And then when I got graded, I got graded down because I didn't do those assignments. You see what I'm saying? I submit in everything, but when it is contrary to what God would have me to do, I submitted to the consequences. I got a lower grade. That's, that was the consequence. I did not. I, I did not, you know, burn at the stake. I just didn't get a better grade. That's it. That's it. I always do. That's what he's saying. Submit. And he goes on to say this. For it is commendable. It's a good job for you to submit to God rather than man. And it's commendable if a man bears up under the pain of the unjust. When I got a teacher and I got a police officer, I got a drill instructor, whatever it is, I've got a, a boss who's in my face and he's making my life miserable. It's, it's commendable if you bear up under the pain of the unjust Suffering because he is conscious of God. I'm putting God first. I'm putting God first. 
He says it's commendable. It's like patting you on the back. Good job when the unjust are suffering. In Colossians, the Apostle Paul says it this way, whatever you do, work as if it was... <clears throat> work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for man. I'll tell you what, you got a hard instructor at school? You just act like it's Jesus who's instructing you and you're doing it for Jesus and not for that teacher. You got a tough boss at work? Poor Kelly. You got a tough boss at work? You got to do it like you're doing it for Jesus. And not for the boss. Listen, he says that is commendable even when it is an unjust suffering that you're going through. But how is it commendable to suffer? Come on, that's the real question here. Well, he answers that question with a question. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? Okay, if I'm lazy and I don't do my assignments and I fail, what glory is in that? There's no credit in that. If you're lazy and you suffer the consequences of that, there, there's no credit to you for that. But then he answers also with a statement. But if you suffer for doing good, you're doing the right thing and you suffer, and you endure that suffering, the penalties, the consequences, this is commendable before God. God God says, good job. You score high in God's, <clears throat> God's credit. <clears throat> it is commendable <clears throat> and credit worthy to you if you will suffer for that which is right. Suffer for that which is right. And then he gets to the very heart of the matter. Our living hope is to be like Christ. He says, to this you were called. You were chosen out of all the world. You're different than all the world. You act different. Um, you believe different. You're not forced into their mold. You were called because Christ suffered for you. He took my sin in his body on the cross. We'll see even more of that in this passage. He left you an example that you should follow in his steps. That's what a disciple is. A disciple was one who follows the leader, and Jesus is our leader. And if he suffered, then we're going to follow in steps that will suffer. That's why he said, hey, take up your cross daily and follow me. He says, because if you're really going to live for me, people aren't going to like that. And you will be per persecuted for your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, this line, you should follow in his steps, was taken, and there was a book written about it by a guy by the name of, uh, I can't even read it, uh, Sheldon, Charles Sheldon, back in 1896. In 1896, he based on this, he, he subtitled his book, In His Steps, uh, with What Would Jesus Do? Ever heard that line before? <laughs> In this novel he wrote, he was having Sunday evening services and he was, each week he'd, he'd write a chapter of it and he'd preach it. But it's a novel. It was different. It was a, he was packing his church with this thing, leaving people on the edge of their seat. And here's how the story goes. A, a preacher's getting ready for his sermon on a Friday evening and a person knocks at the door. He opens the door and it's a homeless vagrant and he needs some help. And he kind of brushes him away because he's too busy with his sermon. And so he closes the door and he gets back to a sermon. He preaches a sermon on the Sunday. Uh, but at the close of his sermon, this guy comes through the back door, comes down to the front, and he stands there and he turns to the congregation and he gives his complaint. He said, I am, a, I am without work. I can't find work and I can't find help anywhere. And then he collapses on the floor and he dies. Whoa. Of course, it's just a novel. It's just a made-up story. But it's illustrating the point here. In the story, the, the pastor, his name is Maxwell, uh, he, he just, he can't, he can't handle this. It's just struggling that he did not reach out to the man and that following Sunday, he preaches a whole kind of different message and he asked the congregation to pledge for one year that they would not do anything without first asking the question, what would Jesus do? The rest of the novel is about the people who made that pledge and how it changed their lives. 
And it changed their lives for good, but also for evil because one lost their job because they were being too goody, two shoes, you know, too much of a Christian. Uh, one lost his whole newspaper company. One was a, a budding singer and lost her career and, and all these things, but, but they all did it for Jesus. Back in the 1990s, about 100 years after this book, this little bracelet came out and people were wearing it all over the place. What would Jesus do, right? But they weren't doing it. It was hypocrisy. I put it on my wrist. I flash it. Oh, I'm, aren't I a good Christian? I got this. It's not about what you show on your wrist. It's about what you do in your life. What would Jesus do? Well, based upon this, you've got to ask yourself, what did Jesus do? First of all, I want to talk about what he did not do. The first thing he did not do, he did not commit any sin. The Bible said he was sinless. He is the only sinless person in Adam's human race because of his virgin birth, the Holy Spirit produced in, the, in Mary a seed, and she conceived and had a sinless child, no sin nature. He had no sin. He did no sin. There was no sin in him. The Bible is just full of this everywhere. He committed no sins. No deceit was in his mouth. He didn't even deceive people. He said he was the Son of God. God was his Father. He is the Son of God. He is deity come in the flesh. No deceit was found in his mouth. He always spoke the truth. He never misled. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. There was no retaliation. I often tell people, I don't get even. I get ahead. Now, I don't mean that. Jesus, the Bible says, could have called 12, 12 legion of angels to his defense, and he let them crucify him. Because in his being crucified, he took our sin and died in our place. He is an infinite person. He's the eternal Son of God. So in a matter of a few hours, he could infinitely satisfy the justice that was due us. He died in our place. And then God raised him from the dead because he accepted his payment in full for our sin. This is the gospel. He did not retaliate and he made no threats. You know, when they were nailing the, his hands and his feet, he, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So, so powerful was that that the centurion who was over the death squad looked afterward and said when he died, this truly was the son of, son of God. He became a believer because nobody dies like that. Everybody they executed cursed them out while they were pounding those nails in their hands. He had no threat. That's what he did not do. So what did he do? Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judge, judges justly. While he's dying on the cross, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He did not retaliate. He said, God will take care of this. And how did God take care of it? Raised him from the dead. Raised him from the dead. He himself bore our sins in his body, Peter says. What? Our sin was put on Jesus, Peter says. So that we, he goes on and says, this, and Paul puts it like this, God made him to be sin for us. My sin was charged to Jesus' account and he suffered blood and died for it so that his righteousness would be charged to my account so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He says he was pierced. Not only said so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness, but by his wounds you have been healed. And Isaiah put it this way. The prophet 700 years before Christ has said, but he was pierced for our transgressions. You see, when they nailed him to the cross, it was nailing our sin to the cross. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. He's not talking about bodily healing here. He's talking about spiritual healing because he's talking about your sins, your iniquities, your transgressions, and, and all of the punishment you deserve. He, he's speaking about all that. You can only find healing for your soul in Jesus Christ. He is our living hope. 
So what must you do? He said, for you are like sheep going astray. So I got the sheep up there. He's going astray. <laughs> He's just wandering away. Sheep, sheep they just wander. They, they take off. This is from a quote in the Old Testament. Isaiah the prophet said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Then he defines it. Each of us has turned to his own way. I'm doing my own thing without God. Then he says, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Someone said, you need to go in on the first stall and come out on the last stall. You go in saying, I'm a sinner. I've done my own thing. I'm a wayward sheep. Yeah, but uh, later the, Lord, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all. But Jesus took all my, my sin away. I'm saved. I'm delivered. I'm rescued by the Lord. Wow. So what must you do? He says, you need to return to the shepherd. And the Lord is my shepherd. So you return. I'm coming back to Jesus and saying, Jesus, Jesus, I need you, Jesus. You are the shepherd who died to take away my sins. I wandered away, but I'm back. I'm back, Jesus. The shepherd, good shepherds take care of their sheep. That's the principle. An overseer, he looks out for your soul. Here's a wrap up. So what do you do? What do we learn from all this? Four powerful principles when someone is in your face. First of all, be submissive. Wow. Secondly, do the commendable thing. Do what is right. Third thing, be credit worthy. Not man's credit. God's credit. God's credit. God's credit. Finally, be Christ-like. Be willing to suffer for what is right. For what is right. With that, we're going to wrap up in prayer. Father in heaven, this is a powerful passage where Peter, who had denied the Lord as one of his sheep three times in one night, then he returned to the Lord as a wandering sheep. Perhaps someone here has wandered away from you, Lord, and today they need to wander right back to you and say, Lord, I need you as my shepherd and the overseer of my life. I know, Lord, if they pray and ask you to be their savior, their shepherd, their overseer, that you will, and you will guide them and direct them. Help us stay close to our savior. Do the commendable and creditworthy things. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.